Welcome to Deconstructing Damsels, a podcast where we take the women in romance and actually talk about them instead of the men. Okay, so today we're going to talk about All of Me by Leanna Morgan. She's a New Zealand person who writes about Montana, which sounds a little bit odd, but it actually really works. I like the world that she sets up. And she created the story where traumatic past doesn't mean you have to give up your future. And I think that's so important because everyone's forever doesn't have to be exactly alike. And no one has to have the perfect ending all wrapped up in a bow. You know, we all go through stuff that absolutely devastates us. And it's up to us to pick ourselves back up, put ourselves together, and find out who we are while... Ignoring the, ignoring the idea of having a relationship sometimes. Sometimes it's better that we take care of ourselves and someone else. But what happens when you start to put yourself back together and you wonder if something more could happen, if something better could happen, if there was something with more possibilities. And that's kind of why I love this book because the two characters, the two main characters, Tess Williams and Logan Allen, are people that have experienced very vicious and life-changing events in many different ways, but they're still able to look at each other and find the common ground before they're in a relationship. They may be attracted, but they're not in a relationship at the time. And it really works for me. It's a clean romance, so there's not a lot of sex, but I don't really mind that because I don't always need to read it. Honestly, I usually skip it anyway. So I'm more interested in the, the lead up and the relationship, and I really appreciated how Miss Morgan put this together. Tess Williams is a former model living in a small town. Bozeman, Montana is not a small town, but it's small compared to like NYC or you know San Francisco or London, all these stories that we read a lot about in contemporary settings. And Tess is this strong-minded, strong-willed person who knows who she is, appreciates herself, but appreciates her mind as well. You know, she's gone through a lot of shit and she knows it, but she doesn't run from that inner turmoil. She goes, okay, what else can I do? And I think one of the best things that I saw from her was being a former model, the fashion world, as we know, kind of preys on people that have got lower um, esteem, maybe not as much knowledge of themselves yet, which is uh, often happens when you pick, you know, young teens to model things that are meant for people in their 40s there's that feeling of of needing to find another balance so her grandparents left her this ice cream parlor back in the day and she turned it into a cafe and it's called angel wings cafe and when she's talking to logan at one point they're talking about how the past can complicate things and create these different little areas that don't really work very well And I think this is probably one of the most honest things I've read in contemporary fiction. Granted, I don't read a lot of it, but I do read it. And she said about the the steam issues with food and how, you know, watching one's diet kind of become everything. She goes, you know, he's like, well, it's not a competition on issues. And she's like, no, but they're a complication because these issues, I mean, we all have a relationship with food. We They all do things together. And so she then continues... They color what I do and add more importance to things that shouldn't matter. Angel Wings Cafe is my way of celebrating food. While I was modeling, I was careful about what I ate. What I looked like became more important than who I was. Providing meals to the Lighthouse Cafe is my way of helping others feel special. And the Lighthouse Cafe is a kind of restaurant of sorts by the local pastor pastor that um, gives people a place to feel like they matter. It's not just food dumped on a tray and you go down the line. It's food made with love and attention and care and it's very obvious how much she cares about the people around her and why she didn't necessarily fit into the fashion world in that way and that's not to say the fashion world is not very giving it's just it's a very brutal industry and you know she's stubborn and and she's kind and you know she appreciates those around her you've got the bridesmaid club which is what this uh, and or this i guess this series is about and they're you know four friends who create this idea of helping others and, and putting something back into the world. It kind of reminded me a little bit of, tw- of 27 Dresses because the Bridesmaids Club exist because they read a story written by Logan that 
talked about how this one couple was robbed and they even took the bridesmaid's dresses. And they're like, why would they need bridesmaid's dresses? No one knows. But between them, they have 17 dresses that they can easily give up for this one wedding. And obviously they were all in one person's wedding because they have four matching dresses. And it's this really interesting way of creating a world where you help others simply by moving something along. And the bride comes in after they discover her because it's a little bit of a sleuthing for a bit, trying to figure out who she was and where she went. Took a couple of days. And you can see the appreciation in the person who's being helped, Connie, but you can also see the, see the appreciation between the women in the group. They love and appreciate who they are, and they've all gone through traumatic things. They've all gone through things that have hurt them deeply. They still manage to stay together, to be solid, to be who they want to be. And I think that's so important as a woman, but also as you know, someone who understands the lack of that kind of camaraderie found around the world right now. And it's so, so, so important. And, you know, there's this kind of beauty in seeing women support each other because you don't always find that in romances. You see a lot of cattiness. You see a lot of viciousness. You see a lot of what I call lazy plot writing because you can always, you can always create more conflict by really looking at the characters and not depending on a trope. And this book does a really good job of that because there's only one instance of really of cattiness and it's not like catty so much as maybe a little bit of jealousy but also a lot of uncertainty. And I think that that's realistic. Like we're all a little bit uncertain. And I'll discuss more about that in a few minutes, but I really wanted to point out that, you know, Morgan does a good job of creating a world where women support each other. And the bridesmaids clubs consist of Tess, obviously, because she's the first in the series, Molly, Sally, and Annie. Sally is the kind one who works for the animal shelter, you know, you know, volunteers there on the weekends and finds homes for all these people when their time is up. She's like the absolute nurturer of the group in that way. And Annie is a quiet one with big dreams and who can cook to rival Tess, who wants to open her own business, who has a plan, who has all this stuff written down and she's got it ready to go, but she's gone through some bad, bad times in her young life. And it just, it, it makes it hard for her to trust people's intentions. And I think that's one reason she really gets along with Tess because Tess's backstory is pretty, pretty brutal in some ways. And then Molly is an Irish photographer who knows Tess from the years where she was a supermodel. And She understands this new world and this old world, and they can kind of balance each other because they understand the in-betweens. And, you know, there's not a lot describing what Molly is on the hunt for, but she obviously wants more because she's doing a book on cowboys. And it's not like, you know, smile kind of photography. It's bone deep what you're watching when people are working and how backbreaking it is and stuff like that. And that's so important to me. And like I said, with Connie, you know, losing her dresses, there was this mystery to find all that stuff. But ultimately, it was an idea that was furthered by other people sending dresses they didn't know. And so there was this like, because Logan wrote a story on it, a follow up to the article about the break in. And they discovered that, you know, more and more women were willing to donate dresses and find places for them because they're never going to be worn again. When you're a bridesmaid, you're often not going to wear that dress again. Very few do. If you've learned anything from Say Yes to the Dress Bridesmaids, there you go. But you can see this this idea of helping others find ways. And sometimes they'll send, like, actual bride dresses. And so it's it's a way of making someone feel important when they can't afford something, but their dream is still there. Like, they've planned it, and they just... They know they can't get the best out of it. And I think that's a really important part of Morgan's world. And I think it's something that maybe more people should be reading. Because this one was written in 2015. I believe the whole, all four books were. And all her works interconnect because I did some sleuthing. That's what I do. And um, all her books connect and they all kind of play in and out so you can get a little bit of here a little bit of there you can follow the stories that way i would say the one thing i would recommend though is that i don't really like jilly who is logan's former colleague in seattle um i wish they had kind of focused more on her kind of maybe round her out a little bit because she was very young she well she read very young probably in her early 20s somewhere around there 
maybe mid twenties in the paper world. And she was just a little bit too stereotypical, which is a surprise because no one else in the series was. So I'm hoping at some point she may get her own story and she may get her own ending and she may get her own growth because Morgan's really good at giving characters the ability to grow together and learn and be independently together, if that makes sense. You know, there's no codependency, I guess I should say. It's they're together, they have relationships, but they still have lives outside of those relationships. I couldn't really think of anything that was comparable to the book. A lot of it reminded me of like the 1990s or 1980s when you know there was a lot of in shows where women were together and they were forming their own kind of communities, living single, designing women, golden girls, those kind of worlds where they depended on each other and not necessarily the men they were with. But it also kind of reminded me a little bit of Claire Cozy and the Coffee House Mystery Series, which is a cozy mystery series there's something very nurturing about the women in this group and you can definitely see a little bit of Claire in there about how she cares and how she takes care of those around and both bake as well and so feeding is a way of saying I love you in a different kind of way and it just it very much reminded me of of that kind of camaraderie through love of food and then of course Tess would be a great Hallmark movie character but I don't know if I necessarily want that because her past would be sanitized and I think that her past is really important. So her past as a supermodel, this is the important bit. She was very successful on many covers, things like Vogue and you know the, the big name magazines and industry standards until one day her friend died. She overdosed. And it was because her friend was dating a senator who was supplying her with cocaine. And eventually she just, her body couldn't take what she was putting into it and she died. And Tess tried to go public and go to the police and say, okay, but this is her boyfriend. This is who's providing it. This is her dealer. And the senator, of course, destroyed Tess's career just in a matter of like months. She had no career whatsoever. So she returned back to Montana to kind of heal and find her way. And that's when she kind of found that that community that she was looking for afterwards because she missed her friend. You know, when someone you consider to be almost family dies over something that could have been prevented, it's a lot. And so she comes back and that's when she, you know, forms the friendships with Molly and Annie and Sally along the way when they all have their own kind of connections. And you can definitely see the, the hurt and the pain and the distrust of a lot of people because it's kind of hard to trust people when You're running from like TMZ and they're kind of a, I think yellow journalism may actually be a step up for them. So you kind of understand where she's coming from in that kind of a situation. And then you have Logan Allen, who is a former Pulitzer Prize winning author. He's won three. We never find out why, but he's won three. I kind of am upset about that a little bit because former journalist, I'd like to know what he won on because he's obviously writing big stories and he suffers from PTSD because while being a correspondent in Afghanistan, he was part of a a group that was attacked by the Taliban and they destroyed a school that, you know, he and some soldiers that were stationed there kind of created a way of letting, you know, kids still learn even through all this. And it, it's a big deal because there was suspicion that someone that he considered to be almost family was targeted and said to be a terrorist. And it's this huge backstory that absolutely devastates him. And he can't go back to being that kind of a journalist. He can't live in a big city. He wants to go quiet. So he goes to Montana because he gets a job there when the Chronicle offers it. And along the way, He starts going to Angel Wings Cafe. He goes three times a week for a year, which means that one of the women was counting. I don't think it was Tess or counting. And he kind of creates this little world where he's got his own friends and most of them from the PTSD group. You've got Dylan, Jeremy, and Todd, and they all have, they all have their own backstories. Dylan was a soldier. Todd's wife and son were killed. And I'm not quite sure what Jeremy's is yet. Because I've, you know, only read a couple books in the series. I'm waiting. 
And so you kind of get this new reality of, of where they fit together and in their traumas because his was a year ago, hers were three. So they're at different points of healing, but they can help each other because they understand. They can follow along. And of course, he wrote the article on the bride that was absolutely destroyed. So they have to help each other and they have to get along in some ways. And then he kind of pulls a uh, don't do that when his sister was visiting and kissed her and, you know, kind of made this big show of, oh, this is my girlfriend because, you know, why not? Tess played along, and along the way, that's when she discovered about the Afghanistan stuff. Not all of it, because his sister mentioned it. But his sister mentioned that, you know, he needs someone like her. And she's like, how do you know? Which makes me think, personally, that he was probably talking about Tess to his sister. At some point, talking about how, you know, she probably makes great meals, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, there's this um, kind of world where, I, I keep saying world, but it's like an interior world within each of these characters. Where he absolutely is slowly getting over his trauma. He's slowly being able to process it in other ways. And it just takes a little time to get there. And Tess understands that, absolutely. She may distrust the hell out of journalists with good reason. But she can understand what he's going through. And, you know, she can help him connect in that way. I will say there's one thing I didn't like about him. And that was he got kind of... He kind of veered into the, you know, vindictive ex idea because he and Julie dated a couple times when they were working together in Seattle, but it didn't work out, so they just became friends. But then he kind of threw under the bus when... Okay, so in the story, this is complicated. So the senator's wife found all these, you know, financial documents about how he had been using their money and campaign money and all that to pay off all these mistresses that he was having and the drugs and all that stuff. So so uh, Logan went live with it because everyone was talking about it and he figured he could take the story and run with it because he would understand what was going on because he knew Tess without mentioning Tess. Well, Julie had gotten a similar story, but she got it a little bit wrong. And eventually she um, did some pretty unethical things as a, as a journalist, like taking pictures of Molly's pictures because... Molly was taking pictures of the dresses they were wearing and stuff like that to kind of put a catalog online so people could see them. And uh, she took digital grainy pictures of that from a, a cell phone or something. And so it wasn't the best idea. It was kind of stupid. But he he puts Tess above her, which I understand love interest. But the dismissiveness of saying that he couldn't count on Jilly's conscience, you know, turning up it made me a little bit mad because you know, 15 pages before they were friends. So does that say something about how he considers friends or how he picks friends or how he looks at people? It just, it it felt a little bit wrong and off. And the only times he, but the only times he didn't really listen to Tess was when he was writing the story and he was telling her she needed to go. She needed to like run in some way. So that way they could avoid all of that kind of stuff, avoid the worst of it. And Tess was like, uh, no, my life, my choice, you're not my, you, you don't own me, you're not my person, so don't do that. But I mean, in general, he listens to Tess's instincts as well as his own, so mm-hmm. kind of that, all that together kind of made me give him about a 14% rating of sucking, which is not bad, by the way, because he wasn't really an alpha asshole. Kind of a nice change. It, actually, he wasn't really an alpha a lot. Like, he was more, he was confident in charge but he wasn't like that typical alpha that you read in romances usually he wasn't perfect for me but i really appreciated him i'd give him a solid a for the work done on coping with the recent ptsd diagnosis and also with creating a new a new connection with people um i love that he finally got the answers at the end about afghanistan and went back i just wish we'd heard more about it i feel like maybe the backstory was a little bit lacking on that you know giving him solid things because it was told from tess's point of view but in like they weren't getting a lot of conversations or blah 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 blah, while he was gone and i felt like it was a missed opportunity there and then uh i really appreciated his family like i mentioned the ptsd group is basically his family there as well as his you know sister but also his mom kathy who came to visit when all this stuff was going down had no problem pitching in and helping out when needed, doing what was ever needed, however was needed. And I kind of love that because she also trusts her son. When Tess 
mentions the whole kissing thing and how his mom's going to be calling him because he's 32 and not married. He goes, he wasn't ready to share his life with anyone and his mom knew that better than most. Obviously, that's kind of how he taught them to kind of respond to this and, and kind of live in that world. For the romance, like I said, it's a clean book. So it's only like one really good scene of sex and it's kind of fading to black. So you don't get a lot of information. But I liked the I liked a little bit of it because they also talk about like when was the last time they had sex, you know, what they've been, you know, if they're on birth control of a sort, you know, that kind of conversations. And it happens in the middle of them, you know, deciding they want to have sex. And to me, that read realistic because how many of us do that? Like, oh, crap, that conversation. We should probably have that now. And so it, it kind of worked almost in a comedic effect to the seriousness. And these are the line. Th- this is the line in the scenes that I love the most. Logan almost fell off his chair when she turned and started devouring his mouth. She could feel his heart beating fast beneath her hands, heard a sigh as it worked its way between their lips. His hands moved in slow deliberate strokes down her back, moved her sides, and then teased her breast. It was more than Tess could take. Her body was on fire. She pushed out of, the ch- of her chair, sat on his lap, straddling his hips, and giving them both more pleasure than they knew what to do with. I like that kind of lead up. I don't need to read everything, but that was enough to tell me that four weeks or so this, mo- this book takes place. They've become friends. They've become lovers. They've become confidants in many ways. And I think that's really, really important. And of course, they ended up with a happily ever after. They ended up in a monogamous relationship, but they were in one where they both equally respect each other and they plan to build a future together. So they're, they've got their outside life. Like she still got the bridesmaids club that hasn't ended all of this. You know, they're still organizing. They're still coming up with stuff. She's still there for her friends. She's still doing whatever she can. And, you know, he's kind of coming together and he's got his work where he occasionally freelances, even though he works with the Chronicle, he's created this this career where he can kind of float when he needs to and he can go do what he needs to when it needs to be done. And I think that's important. And I I think the thing that made me the most interested is the fact that he's loved her for a while because he's been watching her for a year, basically. Not in the creepy way, just in the observant way that, you know, journalists kind of do. We, we, we watch a lot. We comment on it. We see the story as it unfolds. And he says to her before the proposal, I love you, Tess. I can't remember the first time I knew I loved you because it's been inside me so long. I can't imagine you not being in my life, not being beside me. I want to be part of your life to share all the good and not so good times. I want to love you like no other woman has ever been loved. Okay, the no other woman love thing is kind of cheesy, but it it works because of who they are. And in between all of this, my favorite scene, oh my God, my favorite, there's actually a bunch of them, but my favorite scene of all is actually the one where he tells her that in the beginning when they're looking for Connie that he can't like just tell her where her where the source is because that goes against his ethics as a journalist but he says you can follow behind me and I can just be on my way and kind of show you she's like cool all right and then the other three girls decide to join the party because why not I mean you texted them why not they want to know what the story is going and so he's very angry and upset about it Sally is you know kind of like "Uh uh-huh so he tells them, no photos, Logan warned, not until you've gotten, until you've got permission because Molly brought her camera. Sally shook her head. I would never believe you were so. Tess could have ended Sally's sentence with the words uptight, stubborn, or pig-headed. Straight lace, Sally said. Logan turned around and started walking down the street. Tess looked at Molly, Sally, and Annie. She didn't know whether he was leaving them on the side of the road or going to the bride-to-be's house. She walked quickly along the sidewalk. Where are you going? He kept walking. I thought it would have been obvious. We're going to see someone about four bridesmaids' dresses. So he understands at some level that this is a friendship that's not going away. And they're not doing it to be mean or nosy. They're doing it because this is what they want to do. They want to help. And to help, they need to be there. And of course, as this is a mystery, they weren't where they said they, they weren't where they were last week because they had to run away. Or not run away, but find another place to live because they, they couldn't afford to start over when everything has been stolen, including their furniture. They ended up meeting Connie at the paper store where she worked at and kind of made dreams come true, which was good because Connie's mom was really sick with breast cancer. And actually about, I guess, probably like less than 12 hours after they got married, um, her mom died. And so they, Connie and Dave, got married. And you see that this is what the women were trying to tell him that this is what you expect. And I think that's hella important. You do good in the world by putting it out there. That's my motto. 
That's why I help feral cats. It's a thing that I fully believe in. And Leanna Morgan made me such a fan that I'm definitely going to reread this book. And I've already blown through the second book already, so that should tell you how much I enjoyed the writing style and the way I felt about the, the connection of women. And I feel like maybe I would feel better if more of these books were out here like this. You know, ones where they're not Harlequins, but they kind of have a Harlequin feel sometimes. But it's more expanded. It's, it's a bigger universe. It's one where they all can kind of connect. And I haven't read any of the other series yet. But again, I've read the first two, which are Tess and Logan and then Dylan and Annie. And I think that anyone that wants to read smart, intelligent, confident women should probably read this book and kind of make your own decision. But any book that's got women working together independently of men, having their own lives, their own questions, their own probabilities, definitely worth looking into. Okay, before I go, I'm going to feature another podcast. Last time was Spook Hour. This time, it's FYI, the Murphy Brown (laughs) podcast. Because it relates, guys. It relates. Basically, the Murphy Brown podcast is this amazing ability of doing a episode-by-episode commentary. And I love it. I laugh so hard. The reactions are very me. They're very engaging. And the, and the, the two hosts are very, you know, um, how do you put this? Okay, so they know a lot. They know a lot about Murphy Brown. I think it's Lauren that has the scrapbook, I believe, and who has the old DVDs. Well, the, the old VHS is turned to DVDs, now going to be digitalized. And it's making its mark. Like, if you listen, you can actually hear, you know, Joe Reglobuto. Oh, I hope I said that right. The guy that played Frank Frontana. They actually got an interview with them. And that's amazing. Can you imagine getting a star, one of the stars of the show, like, doing an interview with you? And they managed to, like, find a way to get it to where you can go to the recording of the different, like, um, episodes that are coming up because the revival is back and thank the Lord for that. We all need a little bit of political humor and Murphy Brown. I've listened to her say Frank in the back of my head for like 30 years. So it's good to go. But what I really enjoy is the fact that they enjoy it so much. There's so much passion in it. I mean, they talk about the clothing and they talk about how it matches, like the color significance all these little things that I would have never guessed. And I think that more people should be listening to them. So the name of the pod, FYI, the Murphy Brown podcast. Either way, you can find it on iTunes. And they're at Murphy Brown pod on Twitter because everyone should follow them, especially when they have contests, which they're having a contest now. But I don't know if the contest is still going to be going on. So let's just say pay attention to their podcast if you're really into Murphy Brown. And now I want to say thank you, everyone, for listening. And I hope you guys have a really fun day. I'm working on conquering depression. It just may take a little bit of time. Who knows? Triggers are triggers are triggers, and triggering is all the rage. Bye, y'all.